We're going to talk about a hard subject today. What happens to software when making software costs nothing? We are entering a world where AI is enabling extremely cheap software creation. You no longer have to have a computer science degree. You don't even have to know code anymore. You can just type it in English and it will make the code for you and you will eventually be able to deploy it and presumably sell it. The first person who is going to make a million dollars selling software when they don't know a line of code already exists, is already writing code, and is probably only a few months away from making that million dollars. That's the world we live in. And so the question I have is, if that's the world we live in, why does the stock market continue to value publicly traded companies like Salesforce very, very, very highly. Why would you do that when companies like Klarna are saying, we ripped out Salesforce, we don't need, need it anymore, we created our own thing internally? I'm going to tell you why. I actually agree with the market on this one, but maybe not for the reason you suspect. I do not think that just because someone in their basement can type into Replit and make a piece of code, get it out there, make a tiny widget, sell it, that that's going to disrupt enterprise software. I don't even think that the thousands of engineers now being redeployed against AI across enterprise companies, which is a much more serious threat, are going to fundamentally take away the SaaS business model. I don't. And the reason why is because at the end of the day, the businesses that are making money in SaaS are making money off of solving really hard workflow problems with sticky installs on a distribution advantage. All three of those matter. Now, startups have a harder time, and we'll talk about that. But if you are an established SaaS company, you have existing contracts. People don't want to rip out your software if they don't have to. Generally speaking, there's a lot of inertia in your favor. You are already solving a problem for them presumably a problem that they found painful enough to pay you for. Now, they may argue with you about the cost a little bit from time to time, but your product team at this SaaS business is busy making more product that delivers more value and helps support your margins, which, by the way, that's what product managers are supposed to do. So that's the case just from a software perspective for why SaaS businesses are still viable. From a distribution perspective, I think it's even stronger. If you have an existing distribution advantage, if you have sales relationships with existing clients, if you have been working with those clients for a decade or more, if you are a well-known brand in the marketplace like Salesforce is, it is extremely unlikely that you will suddenly lose that distribution advantage and just disappear into the sunset. This is why even though it's technically true that Amazon is only ever a click away. Like you can always leave Amazon. You can always go somewhere else. You only have to type Amazon into the browser for it to appear. You can type Temu into the browser and it will appear. Amazon doesn't have an inherent competitive advantage in your browser, but you still go because the distribution advantage and the brand advantage of Amazon is really formidable. And I notice that people who form a purchase relationship with Amazon tend to stick with it. I'm one of them. People who form a purchase relationship with Walmart or Walmart Plus will tend to stick with it. And that's something that Jeff deliberately architected in the 1990s as part of his timing for starting Amazon. He said people's purchase relationships are going to change with the internet. And there's a limited window when they are flexible or rubbery, and we can grab that purchase relationship, build brand loyalty, and people are gonna stick with us if we deliver good service. And that's what happened. In the same way with SaaS, if people are used to buying from you and trust you, especially for enterprise critical applications, they're gonna keep trusting you. Fundamentally, I think that is why the street values SaaS companies highly still, even in the age of AI. And I'll give you one more to think about. At the end of the day, these companies have every intention of going into AI. Salesforce is going into AI. So is every other SaaS company I know of. They are investing in AI just as much, if not more, as all the startups that are AI native. And they have all the incumbency advantages. This reminds me of the cloud in the 2010s. Before, 
software was licensed and cloud was disruptive. Adobe had to go through this whole reinvention process where they were selling licenses per seat, and then eventually they had to move to a subscription cloud-based SaaS model. It was bitterly opposed internally at Adobe, but it ended up remaking the company and cloud has been a savior for Adobe's long-term revenues and profit outlook. So in the same way, I think there's a lot of potential for existing enterprise companies who already have distribution advantages like Adobe did back in the 2010s to reinvent themselves and get into AI the way Adobe got into cloud. Same thing. And you see that motion. You see Salesforce investing in and branding Einstein and you see other incumbents playing in AI as well. So what does this mean if you are a startup? What if you are building software in the space? I wanna characterize it in two classes. I think if you are a solopreneur, if you are building software on your own, like I said, the person who hasn't written a line of code but is gonna make a million dollars off code already exists and probably will make that million dollars in the next few months. It has never been a better time to be a solopreneur. For startups, the it's more complicated. At the end of the day, you can work faster with AI, you can have a smaller talent footprint. At the same time, you have to fight against those incumbents I just spent five minutes describing. You have to fight against Salesforce and whatever the Salesforce of your vertical is, who have distribution advantage, who have client relationships. And that's always been true if you're a startup, but now you have to double down on AI as a way to differentiate, even while they're already investing in AI, and while customers expect more and more value because AI is teaching them that they need to deliver better and better quality to everyone downstream of their value chain. So for example, one of the stories out of consultancy in the past year is that it used to be that you could deliver a certain quality first draft and that would be okay. Now, what used to be the final draft is the first draft because everyone expects better with AI. I think that is one of the big underlying levers for competition and differentiation in the next five years. Everyone is expecting more because AI is teaching us to expect more. So if you are in the SaaS business, your customers expect more of you. If you are a startup, your customers expect even more of you to disrupt. And your customers have more expected of them to deliver value. There's this cascading effect of the higher demand for quality that AI has created that we are all just living through. So where does this land us as far as SaaS and margins and revenue? I hope I've made the case to you. I don't think SaaS is dead. I actually think that the existing market valuation, which is fairly high for SaaS companies, is roughly justified. I think that they are in a position to win an AI arms race right now. I don't think that AI makes it enormously easier for startups to catch up. Will there be startups that catch up and displace incumbents? There always have been, there will be. I don't think it's enormously easier right now. So that's my take. I actually think SaaS is not dead. I think SaaS is doing fine. I'd be curious to hear your take.